will mix it up. Eisman will be blue line chance. Stop. Lindsay shot, deflex into the net off Del Vecchio's stick. McCarty draws, McCarty in, McCarty scores! He makes a goal! Oh, shoot! He scores! He's got it! Number 525, Cody Howell is Harvey's all-time leading goal scorer. Leswick shot, deflex off Del Harvey's thumb into the net. And the Detroit Red Wings win the Stanley Cup. The Red Wings lift coach Tommy Ivan high on their shoulders. The Detroit Red Wings win the Stanley Cup. Sanchuk marks up his fourth shutout in eight playoff games. I'm very interested in restoring the tradition that we've enjoyed. Hockey Town, USA. We've always been diehard Red Wings fans, and we're going to be for life. The passion between the city and its team is unrivaled. There is a true love affair with the Red Wings of today. We have a captain that does whatever it takes, regardless of his condition, and it's a real inspiration to everybody. And the Wings of yesteryear. Anytime you see Gordy Hobbs, it's real. Would you like me to take off my shirt and show you who's on the back of my jersey? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and that passion has forged a tradition that has players from every corner of the world dreaming of the winged wheel. One team, you know, who offered me even more money on the end of the day, and I said, no, I want to go to Detroit. A hockey town, the attitude, you know, the team, uh, coach, uh, just feeling, you know, I mean, I know it's a hockey town. For me, it's... It's very important to play in the city where the people love hockey. What a feeling it is for a player that to know that your team is always going to want to win, no matter what. They're going to try whatever it takes to win. And uh, as a player, that's, that's what I wanted. And once they slip that jersey on, they dream of creating their own magic. Hockey Town's first taste of glory can be traced back to the first game of the 1936 playoffs when goaltender Normie Smith stonewalled the defending champion Montreal Maroons, shutting them out in a game that went to six overtimes. He still holds the record for the longest shutout sequence. He made 89 saves in that six overtime game and then followed it up with another shutout in game two of the series against the Maroons. The scoring star of the game was little-known forward Mud Brunito. That was his first Stanley Cup game. He'd only been called up from the minors two weeks before the playoffs started, and he'd hardly seen the ice at all. But as the game went on, the players were getting so tired, and they were actually feeding them sugar dipped in brandy between periods to try to keep their energy up. And in the sixth overtime, Jack Adams, the Wings coach, played a hunch and threw Brunito out in the ice. Detroit rode the momentum all the way to its first Stanley Cup championship by ousting Montreal and defeating Toronto in the finals. And in 1937, the Red Wings became the first American team to capture two cups in a row when they knocked off the New York Rangers three games to two. Earl Robertson played golf for them that year, and they found a way to win the cup. It was a dramatic comeback. They were down to the Rangers in the finals, and they rallied behind Robertson, who never played a regular season game in the NHL, and posted back-to-back -back shutouts in the Stanley Cup final. One of Detroit's offensive stars of the era was forward Sid Howe, and on January 23, 1944, Howe led the Red Wings to their largest margin of victory ever when he scored three goals as Detroit walloped the New York Rangers 15 to nothing. However, Howe's most prolific game came 11 days later when he scored a team record six goals as Detroit once again pounded New York 12 to two. Ironically, in 1950, it would be the Rangers again who were the opposition for another of the Red Wings' magical moments. Only this time, a Stanley Cup championship would hang in the balance. With the heavily favored Red Wings trailing three games to two, the team got a wake-up call from an unlikely source. Black Jack Stewart, who was a rugged, tough, nasty defenseman who played for the Red Wings, came into the dressing room between the second and third period and just 
chewed them out. He erupted there <laughs> after, just before that last game when we were all together, and uh, he, he kind of laid it out on the line. He said to them, if they lost this game, he was going to beat them up, never mind the Rangers, and he just laid into every guy, and he got them fired up, and they came back out and won that game. Here's Abel falling over Charlie Rayner right in the goal mouth. Abel's goal gave the Wings a 5-4 win and set up an epic battle in Game 7. With Marty Pavlich in the penalty box, the Rangers scored two goals in 64 seconds to jump into a two-goal lead. In the second period, with Stanley of New York in the box, the Red Wings tied the score with two goals just 21 seconds apart. Pete Babando and Sid Abel pulling the trigger. Then Buddy O'Connor scored for New York, and Jimmy McFadden tied it up again with a Detroit goal. A scoreless third period, a scoreless overtime period, and eight minutes into the second overtime set the stage for intense sport drama. Buster Hewitt had asked me, who do you think is going to score the overtime goal for Detroit? And you'd say right away, either a, a Gordy or a Ted Lindsay, or someone that you knew could put the puck in the net when the players are getting tired. Pete Babando cuts in, he shoots, he scores! The point wins! For the first time, the Stanley Cup was decided by a sudden death goal in overtime. Here we have the seventh and deciding game and a kid named Pete Babando, whose name is only known to history in the record books, nobody heard of him afterwards, scored the overtime goal. The excitement in the Detroit area, Windsor, Ontario, all over the area, unbelievable getting a Stanley Cup and the roof came off Olympia. The Red Wings were creating a tradition of winning. In the 1952 Stanley Cup playoffs, they swept aside Toronto in the first round and met Montreal in the finals. And this time, Detroit rode the shoulders of goaltender Terry Sawchuk, who put on a display unlike anything anyone had ever seen. Sawchuk was a great goaltender. He'd come up with five or six outstanding saves every game. It's probably the greatest goaltending display in the history of the playoffs. The word super performance, I guess, could be echoed for the greatness. Red Burnett, who was covering the series for the Toronto Star, the way he described it was Sawchuk played as if he were triplets. Caprion takes his pass, drills it at Sawchuk, who pulls a great save. Maurice Richard passing off perfectly to Eddie Mazur, who misses a great chance. Elmer Locke steps up Doug Harvey, but the great Terry Sawchuk is right on the job. Didn't allow a goal on home ice the whole playoffs. Won eight straight games, four shutouts. His save percentage was in the range of 970. And Sawchuk marks up his fourth shutout in eight playoff games. He didn't allow a goal in any game played on Detroit ice. Sawchuk is mobbed by his jubilant teammates as the game and the series comes to an end. For the fifth time in their 27 years in the National League, the Detroit Red Wings have won the Stanley Cup. The Red Wings were rolling, and by the time the 1954 finals had arrived, Detroit had won five straight regular season titles. They were now aiming for a third Stanley Cup in five years. We had good goaltending, we had good defense, but most importantly, we had good chemistry. Once again, Detroit faced Montreal in the finals. This time, the two teams waged a battle not to be decided until overtime of the seventh game. Montreal and Detroit really had a dispassionate dislike for each other. They didn't care for each other. Dick Irvin, the Montreal coach, and Adams, the Detroit coach, didn't care for each other. It carried over to the players. And those had been the two powerhouse teams of the 50s. So usually, Detroit didn't win the cup. Montreal did. They hated us. We hated them. But they were a great hockey team. Goals by Montreal's Floyd Curry and Detroit's Red Kelly were all either team could muster until 429 of overtime, when another unlikely hero stepped to the fore. The puck comes off the corner of the rink to Tony Leslie. Leslie shot, deflect from Doug Harvey's son into the net, and the Detroit Red Wings win the Stanley Cup. Tony was the perfect example of... Uh, Tired overtime game, and uh, the puck happened to come over off the boards, and you can almost see it at the old Olympia uh, when Leslie got it. Now, Tony couldn't break a pane of glass with his shot. <laughs> That's what we used to always kid him anyway. And uh, he got it and he shot. Doug Harvey, Montreal's all star defenseman, went to try to catch the puck with his glove. Put the top of his hand and went up over McNeil's shoulder into the net. That Montreal goalie never saw it. And winning Stanley Cups became a habit in hockey town. 
In 1955, a rematch against the Canadiens, the Wings were poised to win their fourth cup in six years. The first two games of the best of seven finals set for Detroit. The Detroit Red Wings, who had trailed Montreal through all but seven days of the regular schedule, had won their seventh straight league title in the season's final game. The finals got off to a familiar start for Detroit. Strong offense and solid goaltending from Sawchuck were the ingredients as the Red Wings took the first two games. Somehow finds Sawchuck coming up with the puck. Harry Sawchuck fights off the frantic Montrealers with three sparkling saves. Marty Pavlich breaks away from the Canadian power play, goes right in on top of Plant before scoring what turns out to be the game's winning goal. The Red Wings in white sweaters were shooting for their 15th straight victory to establish a new NHL record for consecutive games won, and they took little time wrapping up number 15. Marcel Pornovo, a tremendous rushing defenseman, goes all the way using Pavlich as a decoy, swings around Jostrian for Detroit's opening goal. The Red Wings never let up. Rival behind the net, out to Benny White. He flexed it to the corner. And Gordy House pass out, sets up Lindsay, who scores from close in. This was the first of four goals scored in this game by the Detroit captain. Detroit wins 7-1 for a 2-0 lead in game. But Montreal responded. The Canadiens stopped Detroit's winning streak in game three and wound up taking every game played in Montreal. In fact, through the first six games of the finals, each team won all of its home games. And in game seven, the wins went for the kill in Detroit. In the second period, after 27 minutes of shutout hockey, Delvecchio scored a brilliant goal, which gave the Red Wings an all-important first goal. Ahead to Howe, who fires the puck into the corner. It comes out to Protobo, who shot, deflex off. Howe's six for Detroit's second goal. That was Howe's ninth goal and his 20th point. Ahead, three to one. Detroit throw up a rock-bound defense, and a great series comes to a close. They were a dedicated team. Uh, the players, they got along so well together. They, they patted each other on the back. Uh, our checkers, like Marty Pavlich and Presti and Leswick, they weren't worrying about uh, glamour and all that. All they were worrying about winning, everybody gave 100%. It was the last draw for the Red Wings, too. They didn't win another cup again until 1997. So it's uh, kind of the uh, end of a chapter in the history of the team. With Lindsay and Howe leading the way, Detroit was still a power, earning a trip to the finals in 1956. And in 1957, Detroit won its eighth regular season championship in nine years an accomplishment no team has ever repeated. With a town so rich in hockey history, it would be impossible to overlook one of the cornerstones of that tradition, the octopus. In 1952, which was the year they won the cup in the minimum eight games, there were two uh, season ticket holders, the Cusimano brothers, who also happened to own a Detroit seafood outlet. And they thought the eight tentacles of the octopus represented the eight victories that they took to win the cup. So they got this idea that they'd bring an octopus to the game. And basically, they brought it to the deciding game, and they waited till they assumed it was in the bag. And they launched the octopus on the ice. And uh, the public address system, uh, they announced after that, please refrain from throwing octopi on the ice. They are not allowed in the arena. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny, it, it just became a tradition. And in Hockey Town, there's only one place the true fan goes to get their eight-tentacled mascot, the Superior Fish Store. We are the official supplier, our octopi supply, for Red Wing fans. And how many octopus would you like today? I think we'll take two. Oh, baby, do you believe that? First, we'll cook it and get it a little rubbery so we can get a better grip on it. Probably throw her up in a nice ball and launch this from the standing room. The octopus are just raining down onto the ice. 
Still, there's more that goes into this tradition than just grabbing your octopus and firing away. Basically, there's three uh, guidelines. Number one, boiling the octopus. That'll remove any of its uh, natural moisture or slime, and so there'll be no excessive residue when they pick the octopus up. Number two is when to throw it. There's only one proper time to throw it, and that is immediately and immediately after a red wing goal. And then last but not least, placement. Um, never throw it at any red wing personnel, any of the players, any of the opposing players. You always want to throw it in the red wing zone. All in all, the octopus has become synonymous with hockey town, and the fans wouldn't have it any other way. They love it, and the tradition's been long spent, so uh, go Wings. Gordy Howe thrilled Hockey Town's faithful throughout the 50s and started to accumulate his magical numbers as the 60s unfolded. The first milestone came on March 14, 1962, when Gordy became just the second player in history to notch 500 goals. And it wouldn't take much longer for Gordy to reach an even more impressive milestone. In the 1960s, his celebrity had grown as big as his game. But Gordie Howe didn't play to be famous. He did it to be the best. See, I was watching Rocket Richard, who was the, the man with the record, and I, I looked at his age, and then uh, as soon as I had a few more years in, I guess I said, if I can continue this for and take real good care of myself, there is a chance. By the 1963-64 season, Howe had more than a chance at the record, and he would tie it in the Rockets' own backyard. In the 60s, when Gordy was closing in on the Rocket, and um, when he tied the record, um, would you know it was against Montreal, it was Gump Worsley in that. And the way the play developed was really bizarre because the wings were actually shorthanded. Trying to kill off a high-sticking penalty to Alex Faulkner. Henri Richard, Maurice's little brother, and it was Maurice's record that Gordy was chasing. He got messed up on a line change, and he came off the ice when he wasn't supposed to, and it created an opening. October 27, with assists from Bill Gatsby and Bruce McGregor, House skips number 544 by his old whipping boy, Gump Worsley, to pull even with a Rockets record. And there's a photo, actually, I've seen of that play from the side angle, and you can see Henri Richard standing in the doorway of the Montreal bench with this horrified look on his face, knowing that he screwed up. But now the pressure is enormous. With defenses keying on number nine, Howe goes two weeks without a nibble. He'd waited a long time to score that goal, and the pressure and the frustration was getting to him. He was terse with people, and he was just generally in a bad mood, which wasn't like Gordy. Gordy was always, and he still is. Mr. Affable, Mr. Approachable, but they just, I think they, the stress of having the national media follow you around waiting for you to score this goal. I wanted to get it home. That's, uh, I thought I owed that to the crowd. The crowd anticipated that one of these nights is going to be broken. Bernie Howe still after the record-breaking 545th goal as the Red Wings host Montreal. Second period action. The Wings' Billy McNeil gets possession of the puck at his own end. McNeil streaking up ice. Gordie Howe on the right inside the blue line. I grabbed it and I, uh, and I started down, went over the blue line, and I know Gadsby was over on the, other, <laughs> the one side. And you know, the rascal should have given it back to me because I give it to him, he kind of pulled the goal creeper over a little bit, and I got an open net. I was only 10, 12 feet out in front of the net, but he shot it, and bing, it was in the net. And he make, it makes a good shot. Oh, oh, shoot! He's gone! As soon as he shot it for the goal, he said he watched the puck hit the net and he watched it come back out. Smashing the knee to Troy Penn. They're still on their feet. This ovation may never end. We plug this day, folks, November 10, 1963. Today, Gordy Howe passes the great Rocky Bouchard. I have a sneaking suspicion that Mr. Hockey is not quite finished yet. It just proves the point. If you're in love with what you're doing, you can do well. Gordy's passion for the sport was matched only by respect for those who shared his commitment to the game. He always compared me with the Rocket Richard. As a matter of fact, when uh, in Tampa in, in the uh, All-Star game, they brought him down to introduce him, and he's, he was very ill health at the time. So I walked over in front of all the camera and everybody and asked him for an autograph, and he did a big smile on his face. <laughs> Finally, this old Westerner will, will nod to a, a partner. 
Norm Ullman was another of Detroit's magical goal scorers. And in a 1965 playoff game, he set a playoff record that still stands today when he scored two goals in just five seconds. Amazingly, Howe's history of scoring magic lacked one credit, a 50-goal season. Or did it? Uh, 50 was that magic mark because the Rocket has done it. And then later on, other players did it, of course, some with Detroit. Uh, but the payoff is that the 50 was such a target in those days. They, they built it up, 50. Well, we already got up to 47, 48, 49. We're in Boston one night. It was pretty obvious that uh, the puck went in the net. We all, and even the Boston broadcaster at the time said, I think it's Gordy Howe's goal. He yelled over me. And they decided it was off the stick of Red Kelly, I think. But he did have a puck in the net. We all thought of it. Was but 50 didn't mean anything to the power. It's probably one of the few records that he doesn't have uh, over the years. But uh, I don't remember a lot about whether, um, how cognizant I was of the fact that uh, that nobody had done it when I got into a, into a position to probably hit the 50 or it looked like I might have a good shot at it. Detroit's first 50 goal scorer had his own share of goal controversies. And I had scored a goal that they disallowed and it would have been my 50th, my fourth of the game and it was a big hullabaloo about it and big controversy. Uh, it really was in the net. They showed on the weekend, they had pictures in the paper. But anyway, it didn't get, get allowed and, and so I walked into Toronto with 49 and uh, the 50th goal wasn't a spectacular goal. It was one of those uh, crazy shoot it from the blue line and deflect off your stick and go into the net. But And I think we whacked the Leafs about 8-1 to one that night. So And I got one later on just for good measure. Mickey Redmond's stellar seasons, however, are a mixed brew of bittersweet memories. The unfortunate thing is that both the times that, that I scored 50 goals, we missed the playoffs. And uh, it really, you know... It diminishes uh, your individual stuff uh, when you don't have team success. Uh, it's a pretty good hockey club in those days as well. Although Alex Del Vecchio never scored 50 goals in a season, there were very few players who scored with such consistency. Over the course of his career, Alex scored 456 goals and racked up 1,281 points. And when he retired early in the 1974 season, Del Vecchio was second only to Gordie Howe. Del Vecchio played his entire NHL career at the corner of Grand River and McGraw. The Olympia was a Detroit landmark when it opened in 1926. The building had a unique presence that became a player and fan favorite. The building was uh, a little different than a lot of the other rinks at that time. They, they said it was like an egg shape. Uh, the rink, the way it was, uh, the boards were, uh, the corners weren't that deep. Uh, you'd get over the blue line and then all of a sudden, halfway down, they'd start to come in and, and, and form a, a real oval shape rather than the deep corners of the Montreal Forum or the, the, you know, the, the big ice surface of, uh, of uh, Toronto. It, it, they, it was completely different. The ice was always, always very good at the, uh, at the Olympia. Perhaps day in, day out, they said it was the best ice of, of the six surfaces that the original six played on. It was a great place to play. Of course, everybody was on top of you, like all the old rinks. On our bench, too, the people were right there. And, they, you know, we were almost in their way. They couldn't see. If we stood up, they couldn't see the game. So it's, uh, and then you, when you walk through, you walk through the crowd. And, and people like that. Everybody was tight here. The fans were tight. So uh, very intimate. You have many a player from the other teams the, the, where the best rink was to play, and they, even Rocket Richard chose Detroit. The Olympia was also Gordy Howe's favorite place to play. For 25 seasons, Gordy would continue to break his own records as the best goal scorer in NHL history. But in 1971, Mr. Hockey was forced to retire due to a wrist injury. But the retirement would be short-lived. 
By the 73-74 season, Gordy was lured out of retirement for the chance to play with his sons Mark and Marty in the World Hockey Association. Years later, all three skated together in the NHL as part of the Hartford Whalers as Mr. Hockey continued to defy the laws of nature. Meanwhile, in Detroit, the curtain was coming down on the Olympia. In the fall of 1979, after 53 years of timeless memories, the Red Wings played their final game at the corner of Grand River and McGraw. There was a lot of sadness that night uh, because I think like, like there is in, in the closing of a lot of old buildings, uh, there's just too many memories that you don't want to let go of, of all the happy moments. You don't ever think about the bad times and all the bad things that happened, but when you look at these stadiums and you remember the Stanley Cups that those teams won there and the players that played there, uh, it's, it's always tough to leave those buildings and uh, those types of memories. The Olympia was demolished in 1986. Now, an armory occupies the corner where so many memories occurred. The Red Wings alumni paid tribute to their former home by erecting this plaque in its memory. Even though the players said goodbye to their old home, they were excited about what the Joe had to offer. Uh, we didn't have very many amenities when we started playing. But now all of a sudden you go into Joe Lewis Arena, you don't even think about the seating and the rest of it. You walk into this beautiful plush uh, living room type dressing room. To see this, I mean, you were, you were in awe. And it was uh, like, uh, like my first cars. My first car was a Volkswagen, 1956. And all of a sudden now I'm driving a Cadillac. Although the new amenities didn't seem to help the Red Wings as a team, the city was boosted by the opportunity to host the 1980 NHL All-Star Game. It didn't take long to establish new memories as the greatest Red Wing ever was introduced. And from the Hartford Whalers, representing all of hockey with great distinction for five decades, number nine. The fans of Detroit greeted their favorite son with a standing ovation. I was awkward, very nervous, and there was almost a tear, so I went over the bench, talked to Lefty Wilson. And it just happened that Gordy came towards me, and I was going towards him off the bench. And we, we started talking. I can't give you the words, but we were talking about it. And, I, and he's bilingual English and profanity, <laughs> and he ripped me pretty good. He said, what are we going to do now? I said, just take it, just take it, kid. You deserve it. And he put a laughter on me and went back on and I relaxed. I didn't totally relax. Mr. Hockey relaxed enough to give the fans what they came for. Barber into the corner. Howell takes it away. From Watson, center, Sekluce, scores! Kluce, set up by Gordy Howe. Well, that's what they've been waiting for. And oh, boy, look at the... They're just going crazy in here. Two months later, Red Wings fans saw Mr. Hockey add another page to his legacy. Gordy led the Whalers into Detroit, and for the first time in history, a father and son combination would start a game in the NHL. Now, Marty had a 103 temperature. He was, he was a very sick puppy, and the coach told him that he said, Marty, uh, you got a high temperature, you have, you're a little dizzy. He said, uh, as soon as the pucks drop, get off the ice. And I and I went I went out there and I said uh, I said do you hear the coach he said no select of hearing <laughs> he said I'm out here boy I'm staying this is this is a, the time of my life so uh, I started in the middle and Mark was over on the left and Marty was right and uh, we had a great time for me it was almost like I was a uh, a surrogate son for me because like in, in essence when I started uh, I think. My first year was probably Gordy's 20th year. Like, he made you feel part of the family when I first started in 1966. So I, I, I was proud of that fact. And, and, you know, to see Marty and Mark out there with, with Gordy was, was, you know, a visualization that I, that I had, uh, being able to do that with, with my father. After 32 years of professional hockey, Gordy Howe officially hung up his skates for the last time at the end of the 1980 season. He left a legacy of greatness for the entire hockey world to follow.
1982, Mike Illich bought the Red Wings, and a new day had dawned in Detroit. 1982, when we bought the team, it was called the Dead Wings, so we had to rebuild a franchise. I'm very interested in restoring the tradition that we've enjoyed for many, many years, for the past 50 years. I plan to uh, surround myself with a lot of competent people, roll up my sleeves and work 24 hours a day if it's necessary. In the 1970s, disco was alive, but the Red Wings were not. The franchise stumbled to an all-time low. The 80s appeared to offer little change, but Mike Illich hired Jim Devolano, and the new general manager's first draft pick was Steve Iserman. Well, first of all, in 1983, this was not hockey town. It was very important that the player we took number one, fourth overall, uh, had to be a, a player that we could build this franchise around. That was extremely important. I mean, I think Jimmy D uh, made the decision on, uh, on who he's going to draft, and uh, he hailed it as a cornerstone. We were a little bit fortunate. Uh, Steve played for the Peterborough Peets, and he played on a team, it's a little unusual, that rolled four lines. And so Steve was still only playing every fourth shift. And so he, he wasn't able to rack up the points that he probably would have. And I'm convinced that that helped us get him. Again, we're talking about somebody that was probably 160 pounds at the most. If he wasn't ready and strong physically enough to play, we were certainly prepared to send him back for another year of junior hockey in Peterborough. That was really a possibility. Now the funny part of the story. He came to training camp, and within five minutes, he was the best player we had. Unfortunately, he didn't have too much to work with, and, uh, and I think he was a different hockey player then. I think, uh, I don't know whether Steve would agree with me or not, but I think he did an awful lot more of the, the shooting. The He wasn't a complete hockey player back then, but that, he was a youngster. He was growing, he was learning, he was developing, all of those things. Side of the goal for Probert. Probert for Eiserman, he scores! I remember growing up, you know, I was probably 12 years old, and, and uh, coming here, you know, it was highly touted. Um, it was just amazing. You, you come just to watch him. Uh, you know, back in those days, being a Red Wings fan was tough because, uh, you know, they didn't win too many hockey games, but uh, you always knew that you're, he was going to put on a great show. But this Red Wings show lacked a big finish. Detroit's rising hopes turned to frustration with bitter playoff losses in the mid-90s, including a sweeping defeat in the 1995 Stanley Cup Finals. It was disappointing, um, particularly getting to the finals and being swept. We were in and out of it so quickly. I think even more so than those years were the previous years when we had lost in the first round, particularly the year we had lost to uh, Toronto. Um, coming into the playoffs, we were playing well, and I really thought uh, at that time we might, you know, we might have an opportunity to win the Cup. So that was a particularly uh, uh, disappointing loss. Steve Eisenman and this team through the early 90s were very good but they paid a price. They went out early in rounds and in series uh, in the playoffs that they probably shouldn't have, but they did. That's just the way it goes. And I think he learned a tremendous amount having to deal with those failures on the road to the successes in 97 and 98. With every passing year, Iserman had helped the Red Wings move a notch closer to the ultimate goal. And in 1996, he led Detroit to an incredible 131-point season as the Red Wings won an NHL record 62 games and a second straight President's Trophy. But there was still one final mountain to climb. In the 1996 playoffs, the Red Wings failed to reach the summit again as the eventual Stanley Cup champion Colorado Avalanche played a more physical series and punished Detroit. The Detroit Red Wings are going to be eliminated from the Stanley Cup playoffs. And the Avalanche are going to win the Western Conference Championship. Last year was a lot of pressure, a lot of expectation from us. Media and the fans already gave us a cup before the playoffs start. 
After years of building a finesse team, early in the 1996-97 season, Detroit decided to make a change. On October 9th, the Wings traded Paul Coffey and Keith Primo to Hartford for Brendan Shanahan. Here is Shanahan, top of the zone. He scores! Brendan Shanahan has scored for the first time as a Detroit Red Wing. Shanahan proved his worth, helping transform Detroit into a more physically imposing team. It is not the same Detroit team. Scotty Bowman has retooled his wings, has made them less pretty and a little more gritty. For the new, tougher wings, the biggest test of the regular season would be their arch rivals, the Colorado Avalanche. It is an off end. And we see it for Larry go, but he did, and now Darren McCarty. And look who came all the way out to try to help. Patrick Waugh. Oh, my goodness. Lemieux was hammered by Darren McCarty, and he is being helped into the locker room. They are on their feet here at Joe Lewis Arena. Detroit had finally settled an old score and now had to focus on winning the game. They need to get one back again. 13 20 to go. Down by two. Now back center off the drive. That's his second goal of the night. And the Red Wings have pulled back more than one. And hands down low. Shanahan now behind the net. Looking to the side of Juan. He's going. It went off the skate of Patrick Waugh, and the game is tied at five. And now the Red Wings with the fresher legs, and it is showing that play. Larry on a You know, that was, I think, the game that really lit a fire under this hockey club. The fired-up Red Wings finished third in the Western Conference and met the St. Louis Blues in the first round of the playoffs. And up saved by Pure rebound score, Kurt Maltby. The Detroit Red Wings have advanced to the second round. Next up was Anaheim, and a chance for Detroit to prove this year was going to be dramatically different. And for the third time in four games in this series, an extra session will be required. The sweep is complete. I think it was, you know, obviously the way we started the series was big, and uh, most importantly, it just seemed like a real team effort. It was a feeling of self uh, confidence when we were able to win in triple overtime, double overtime, and single overtime, and, and that was, uh, I think that was a growing learning experience right there. These two teams met in the conference final last year. It was Colorado who came away with a win and ultimately won the Stanley Cup. For the Detroit Red Wings, with all the bad blood, what matters to them most is to get this thing turned around and get the W in the series. I don't know if there were any more days off, whether or not there could have been enough to be written about these two teams anymore. I mean, it is just time to drop the puck. The game lived up to its billing. However, it wasn't the opening Detroit had hoped for. Cross with Richie. Lemieux, center, center, score. Richie. Two to one avalanche. In game two, the Red Wings fought back behind their captain, Steve Eiserman. Eiserman moves into the middle. Sandstrom with it. Eiserman. Shot save made. What a rebound. Yeah, he scored. Steve Eiserman got the rebound. He backed it in. Play by Steve Eiserman. Man. As the venue shifted, the Red Wings capitalized on their newfound momentum and took a commanding three games to one lead over Colorado. The Red Wings stumbled in game five in Denver leading coach Scotty Bowman to challenge his troops. I had just felt the urgency to tell the team that what an opportunity, that teams would love to be in our spot, that, you know, we have a chance to, to knock out a Stanley Cup championship team from the year before by winning a hockey game, and that if they didn't come up with the game of their lives individually, they'll always regret it. 
Detroit took Bowman's words to heart and responded with fire. The Red Wings have now outshot Colorado in the game 25 to 7. One thing that I do remember is Joey Kosher came skate up to me and he whispered in my ear, he goes, the next one's better. You know, he said, the next one's better. Game one, Sloon Air Program, Flyers versus Red Wings, Stanley Cup Finals. Hello everyone and welcome to the 1997 Stanley Cup Finals, pitting the Detroit Red Wings against the Philadelphia Flyers. For the Red Wings, this is about redemption. Bitter disappointment marked their last two playoff exits, but they're back now trying for the Stanley Cup once again. Eric Lindros, Brendan Shanahan, John LeClaire, Steve Eiserman, they all chase hockey's ultimate prize starting tonight. With the game tied at one, an unlikely hero stole the momentum for Detroit. Sanderson's pass is stolen. Around in front, Koser, he scores! And Joey Koser, what a move he makes on Ekstall into the roof. Joe Koser, who is playing on a 30 and over team at Christmas. And the Detroit Red Wings have won game one of the Stanley Cup Finals. In game two, Garth Snow replaced Ron Hextall in goal for the Flyers, and the Red Wings treated him the same. The Flyers came roaring back with two power play goals from Rod Brindamore. This is almost a carbon copy of the Brindamore first goal because he knocked it down the same way. The Flyers were looking to take their first lead of the series, but Kurt Maltby had other ideas. The play the other way, shot on Maltby, score! He went in and out! It's a 3-2 lead for Detroit! In the third period, the Red Wings were looking for the knockout punch. Round two and control of the series had gone to Detroit with the finals heading to the Joe. The Wings were only two victories away from their first Stanley Cup in 42 years. With the score tied at one, Ron Hextall and the Flyers felt the full force of the Red Wings arsenal. Come on, White! Come on, boys! Detroit once again gained the lead, this time on Nicholas Lidstrom's blast from the blue line. And as the legends of yesteryear looked on, the Red Wings delivered the final blow. It is just love pouring out, that's all it is. We've 
won the Stanley Cup. We've got a summer to enjoy it and start all over again. Let's make this the greatest summer of our lives. One thing you'll never forget is that phone call that we got. Uh, we were still at the golf course. We were just getting ready to uh, to take the Stanley Cup ar around town, and uh, we got that tragic phone call. And you know, right then, uh, everyone called their you know their wife, girlfriend, or fiance, and you know, let them know what had had happened. Expected each morning to wake up and that you were going to read in the paper that uh, they were released from the hospital. And everything was going to be normal. And day after day, it kept going, and you realize that. Things aren't going to get to normal for maybe forever or for a long time. When the 1997-98 season began, the serious auto accident of Vladimir Konstantinov and Sergei Manatsakhanov weighed heavily on the Red Wings. Besides losing Konstantinov, Conn Smythe Trophy winner Mike Vernon was traded to San Jose. For myself personally, Mike wasn't here. I mean, he did a lot for me and uh, helped make me the, the goal that I am today. And more or less, uh, you know, I... I miss his companionship, but at the same time, I was excited to be on my own and do my own thing. Osgood proved to be worthy of the task, and the Red Wings faced the Phoenix Coyotes in the first round of the playoffs. Even though Osgood was tested, the Red Wings won the series in six games to move on. The defending champions are still defending. The Blues were up next for the Red Wings. After splitting the first two games in Detroit, the Red Wings took the next two in St. Louis. Unable to win the series at home, the Wings put on an offensive show in St. Louis to beat the Blues 6-1 to one and win the series four games to two. And this one is over and the Detroit Red Wings will move on to play Dallas in the Western Conference Finals. The Red Wings and Stars split the first two games in Dallas before Detroit took control of the series on home ice. In game four, the team and its fans had two very special guests. We believe in their strength and recovery. We know that all of you believe too. Welcome back, number 16, Vladimir Konstantina. And Sergei Mamatakana. Inspired, the Red Wings beat the Stars to take a three games to one series lead. Back in Dallas, the Stars took game five with one lucky bounce of the puck. And the pass in the lead, in the middle, line and Root. Everybody gets bad bounces. Everybody gets bad, makes makes some plays that they wish they had back. I mean, that was one of them that I wish I could have back. But I mean, I just put things behind me. I don't think about them for a second or even a minute after it went in. I just kind of left the ice. And when I was walking in the room, I said, "Geez, you know, I'm going to play the best game I played in the playoffs." And after his teammates gave him a two nothing lead, Ozzy made good on his promise. Got it down the gentlemen welcome to the 1998 Stanley Cup championship between the Eastern Conference champion Washington Capitals and the Western Conference and defending Stanley Cup champions your Detroit Red Wings 
Well, the Red Wings have been around this title for the better part of a decade. Third trip to the championship final in the last four years. They're the defending champions. Everything seems loaded for Detroit except for one unreasonable doubt. No matter how unfair, they're trying to repeat with a different goaltender tonight. Detroit jumped out to a 2-1 to one lead, and it was up to Chris Osgood to protect it. Osgood reaches out, pokes it into the corner. Bellow center, shoot a win! Saved by Osgood! So it's Juno with a chance of a lifetime to tie it up. The way by Juno. Juno moves in and shoots. Glove saved by Osgood! The Wings held on for the 2-1 to one victory in Game 1. In Game 2, Detroit trailed Washington 4-2 to in the third period. The t shot, shot, shot! third period. Martin LaPointe's goal brought the wings within one, and after that, destiny took over. Teakin it, right in, missed the open net. What is going on in this period? United States, Washington, D.C., and there is a new star in town. Lord Stanley has pushed Ken Starr right out of the headlines as this town has gone completely cup crazy. The Capitol fans didn't have much to cheer about as the Red Wings captured Game 3. In Game 4, Detroit fans weren't disappointed as the Red Wings again pounded the back of the net. And the Red Wings pour it on. Kozlov coming right in. See, I mean, it's almost like a movie script, really. Just an amazing display of human perseverance from training camp all the way through. And Vladimir Konstantinov will make the initial lap around the ice here at the FCI Center. I mean, this is just incredible. Well, they gave it to Ozzy right away. Tell the world, baby. Tell the world. Yes! Well, the Detroit Red Wings had the depth, they had the leadership, and they had the coaching. And when you get those three things going in the same direction at this time of the year, here is the rich reward. They got her again, Scotty. Back it goes to Draper. Draper looking on it. Draper center turn. Oh, no. the puck towards the net. It was knocked down. Eisenman picks it up to the side of the goal. It's center. He passes. He scores! Number 600 for Steve Eisenman on a power play against the Oilers, and it's a standing goal with the Joe for Stevie Y. And congratulations to Larry Murphy. His 1,549th game ties Alex Del Vecchio, another former Red Wing, the second most games ever played in the NHL. Scotty Bowman wins his 400th career game back to the Red Wings bench. Only Jack Adams with more with 413. And can 
Congratulations to Brendan Shanahan, career point number 1,000. And what a classic Brendan Shanahan goal, too.